This webinar is brought to you by SAFE and the Gold Seal Online Ground School, where instructors join for free. Visit Gold Seal at OnlineGroundSchool.com. Hi everyone, I'm Russ Still with Gold Seal. As flight instructors, we all know that our first goal is to teach. We want to produce safe, proficient, and competent pilots. But transferring knowledge, <laughs> but transferring knowledge is not always as simple as it sounds. There are best practices and even plain old tips that we can all take advantage of. Now during this program, we want you to be involved, so please tweet us your comments using hashtag AskGoldSeal or on Facebook. And make sure you stay with us for the entire program because we're going to be giving away some pretty cool door prizes at the end. For this special presentation produced with SAFE and the FAA FAST team, we've assembled a dream team of professionals with countless hours of experience, years too, and highly successful careers. I'm sure you'll recognize them all. From San Clemente, California, we have one of the most recognizable names in aviation. Rob Machado, thanks for being here. Good Thank you, you. Russ. It's a, Good. It's a, it's a little pleasure. bit of I, there. I, I have to say that was a that was a great video. That was fantastic, uh, and that last landing right in the center line. I was thinking if that were me, I would have had to call the tower and have him activate the runway center line widening device. So that was excellent, Russ. It's a real pleasure to be here. And you know, if I can distill down everything that uh, that I like to do in aviation, it's one thing, and that's help people become private pilots with. Uh, a minimum amount of cost and a, a minimum number of government hurdles they have to jump through. And in the same token, the uh, complement to that is helping flight instructors do their job easier and more efficiently. And I like to think I do that because on my website, I have a, a section that's available for CFIs that uh, are basically consist of flight instructor tools that they're all free to the general uh, flight instructor. All they have to do is go to do uh, rodmachado.com or becomeapilot.com, the website that'll be in the bottom of the page. And those are all great free tools, very useful. And uh, I also have an affiliate program that they can join. And uh, that pays 25% on any of the products that go out of my office that a CFI sells. So it kind of helps with the income. Um, but the most important thing is that, you know, aviation is an exciting thing, and I'd like to get more people in it. Excellent. Well, good. Next, uh, joining us from Flagstaff, Arizona, we have author, Master Instructor Number 1, 2000 National Flight Instructor of the Year, and AOPA Flight Training Columnist, Greg Brown. Greg, how are you doing today? Doing great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, welcome, everyone, for, and thanks for coming. Okay. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing lately, Greg? Okay. Well, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a longtime columnist for Flight Training Magazine. I write the Flying Carpet column. Uh, this is my 18th year doing it, actually. And uh, my goal with that column is to help keep your students flying. Uh, as you know, most of the magazine is about how to be a better pilot, uh, how to master landings, how to read weather. But my objective there is to provide the carrot of some of the fun things you'll get to do uh, once you're a pilot and hopefully keep our people uh, at it. Uh, some of you may not know all of my different lives. I also am a, I write books and along with the flying carpet book, I've done several others that uh, some of you may know. One is called the Turbine Pilot's Flight Manual and that is a book for people transitioning to turbine aircraft, an introductory book. It's very popular. It was my first book and we're in the third edition of it. Job Hunting for Pilots is another book I did, uh, Tricks for Networking to Get Yourself a Piloting Job. You Can Fly, which is uh, targets our students, um, people who are prospective students to explain to them why they should learn to fly. And when I'm not doing those things, uh, this actually started because my column is illustrated with photographs. I become pretty active uh, doing fine art photography from the air and actually sell some photographic prints of aerial views in hopes of turning on our audiences with that. And uh, there's, you've got a clip uh, nearby Sedona, uh, me doing some shooting. Um, the thing that uh, brings me here tonight uh, is my book, The Savvy Flight Instructor, which is somewhat unique in that it's not a how to teach book, rather it's a how to succeed in the business of flight instructing, including how to keep your students motivated, uh, how to sell your services, how to make money at flight instructing, 
uh, many, many different aspects ranging from marketing to standardizing. And uh, I'm real proud here, you're seeing the latest edition that just came out this past year. If you do pick up this book, be sure you get this one that has the clouds on the cover because it's the edition and has uh, vastly expanded information about using tools like social networking to promote our flight training businesses. Well, you certainly are, you know, known as the savvy flight instructor, so we're really glad to have you with us tonight. Uh, also with us tonight is David St. George. Dave is a DPE, 10-time Master CFI, and SAFE's board chairman. David, how are you doing? Good, Russ. Thanks for having me aboard. Good. Can you tell us a little bit about SAFE and how it uh, works, how it helps out the, the flight instructor community? Sure. SAFE is uh, an acronym for that stands for the Society of Aviation and Flight Educators. Uh, we're a not-for-profit all-volunteer organization and SAFE members are actively involved obviously in teaching and our mission is to create a greater aviation safety by elevating the level of professionalism and excellence. Uh, SAFE works actively with the FAA by creating standards uh, driven by what we see that works in the field and SAFE has developed for the last nine years the CFI DPE quarterly forums uh, for the, the meetings for the FAST team. Thank you, Doug Stewart. And our member membership contains uh, probably a disproportionate number of DPEs, master instructors, and general award uh, winners. And I should mention also all that goodness, uh, not-for-profit, all volunteers, is only possible because of our amazing sponsors like ForeFlight, Cloud Ahoy, Gold Seal, Modern Pilot, Flying magazines, 40s, uh, bows tonight, given the headset. So it's a great organization to be part of. Excellent, excellent. Well, I can't tell you how, uh, how proud and honored I am to be on the same screen with you three guys. Don't know that I belong to be here, but I'm certainly glad to. And this is going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be a fun panel discussion, and we'll provide you, the professional CFI, with actionable tips on how to have a more professional and more satisfying career and run, op run operations. Uh, so we have uh, a number of questions already that we've picked out that we thought might be good topics for tonight. But again, any of you watching, please, you can send us your questions, should you have any, at hashtag AskGoldSeal. Or if you're watching on Facebook, just put it down in the comments box below and we'll do the best we can to field them. Now the first one that we have uh, is, what is the most effective way for a CFI to learn to be a better and more effective teacher, especially if that CFI has little or no teaching experience. David, do you want to uh, take a shot at this one? Uh, sure, Russ. Um, basically, that's the essence of the whole discussion, I think, tonight. Um, and it's what SAFE does, really, is enable uh, CFI success. Um, but what I, I kind of have a target audience for this, and it's probably our hypothetical CFI that went to one of these 10-day academy courses and got his CFI, double I, MEI, all in 10 days. Um, you know, congratulations, you survived that. Um, but, you know, acquiring all those ratings in that amount of time, we know they spent most of their time learning how to pass the FAA test, not learning how to teach. Um, so like every other certificate, they have a license to learn and, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. So my very first actionable step to success for somebody like this is to take all those carefully created lesson plans that you sweated over and marked up and had ready for the practical test and immediately shred them. Um, so that's, you know, get your pencil, write that down, shred lesson plans, because all of those lesson plans are directed at a hypothetical audience. And when you start to become an instructor, you're not teaching a hypothetical student. You're teaching individuals. And probably the best thing you can do to become a better instructor is to get that into your head right away is each one of these is going to be a different lesson. It's going to be a different person. It's going to require different techniques. You have to come to know them. You have to get their learning styles down. And uh, that's the only way you're going to be successful. So first thing is to really start to customize your instruction to every person. The second thing I came up with as actionable advice is to get two different books. Um, one of them is free online. It's called How People Learn. And it's what I tell my CFI students is sort of the expanded FOI. It's really a very comprehensive book on how people learn, how to teach. And as I said, we'll put the link up with the YouTube video. It's free online as a PDF or HTML. The second book I would also recommend is from my hero, Greg Brown, um, the savvy <laughs> flight instructor. I think it's a wonderful book. 
And personally, I got it when I had about a thousand hours of teaching. I already had a gold seal as a flight instructor. I already was a 141 chief instructor, but it definitely changed my life. And, uh, you know, I became a master instructor. Uh, I became a DPE and it made all the difference in my uh, career. So for everybody, I would recommend those two books. Um, last two things are to really focus on mastering the communication skills, uh, communication and compassion. Because most flight instructors are very big in aviation, but they haven't really kind of worked on the other side of the house. And what you'll discover is that's probably where you're going to spend most of your time is not writing a lift equation on the board, but dealing with the psychology of instructing. So you really want to work on that soft side of the uh, house and get the communication skills down. And the last thing I would recommend is getting a mentor or a coach, uh, somebody that can help you through those first steps. I always point out to my CFIs that in Canada, when you start, you're a class four instructor. You can't even teach without the supervision of a more senior instructor. So those four items, shred the lesson plans, get the two books, master the soft skills and get a mentor, I think really will help everyone to become a better CFI. That's great advice, Dave. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, just to second your uh, observation about Greg's book, Savvy CFI Instructor uh, Hap probably is the single most important book uh, a new flight instructor can pick up in terms of uh, learning how to perform the craft of flight training as well as how to do it, uh, do it well. And uh, Greg made a fantastic contribution there. So uh, that's, that's an absolute must. You know, as I thought about this, I think uh, of all the things that have helped me, unfortunately, when I was becoming a CFI, I didn't have uh, Greg around to, uh, to use his book. So I kind of, you know, it, it, in learning to do anything, you basically have to do two things. You have to read a lot of books and ask a lot of questions. And uh, that ultimately is the way that you acquire knowledge. And one of the things that uh, really helped me a lot in terms of um, learning a, a person's teaching style, just like you mentioned, um, I have a little technique that I've always used and it works really well. With a brand new student, uh, any student that I'm first introduced to, um, I ask him this question. I ask them, how do you learn? How do you prefer learning? What is the uh, way that you learn information most quickly, the way that fatigues you less, the way that you find most inspiring? And then you kind of throw out things like, do you like a lot of demonstrations? Do you like uh, a lot of talk? Uh, do you like not much talk? And ultimately, students generally prefer less talk as they start to get more proficient. And that question has probably uh, offered a payoff that just exceeds its uh, its weight in phenomes and syllables. It's uh, it's a real powerful question to ask and served me very, very well. And the next thing is, and you mentioned this, find a mentor, which is just excellent advice. Um, you know, you can find a mentor in aviation, but there are a lot of mentors outside of aviation when it comes to looking at the way that they convey information. And uh, I'm talking about, for example, Richard Feynman, the famous uh, physicist who wrote a book uh, called Surely, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. And uh, it's an excellent book to read, but you learn about how Richard Feynman taught. And if you go on the uh, YouTube and you type in Richard Feynman and you can listen to a couple of his lectures on quantum physics. Now, hold on. Wait, come back here. Don't 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 run out the door. Uh, it's not the quantum physics that's important. It's the way he explains it. And that kind of um, that kind of communication, you watch how he does it, how he builds from the building block, block principles mm -hmm. from something very simple to very complex, the ultimate uh, strategy one wants to use and should use in conveying anything. It's powerful. And there are a lot of people like that on the Internet that uh, can offer great teaching strategies, despite the fact that they may not be directly aviation related. Greg? Well, first, I'd like to thank you guys, two people I admire greatly in our industry for saying those wonderful things about the book. I appreciate that. Uh, you mean it. I'm just, I'm just going to build on a couple of things that others have said, actually. The ask questions part uh, is really a, a, a significant trick. And I actually uh, polished this from my good friend Jim Pittman, who uh, they gave me his first ever flight review. I didn't know it at the time, but the first question he asked me was, what do you need help on? What do you feel weak on? Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, like a like someone uh, doing confession at the church, I bowed my head and told him all the things that I felt 
week at, and then he, we proceeded to cover them in the flight review. And uh, that was a great lesson from someone new at this about the importance of asking people what they expect to get out of their training. It's just a really valuable thing that I can't uh, agree enough about the value of a mentor. It, your first teaching position ideally should be with the best flight school, the best instructor you can find because your habits are going to be developed there. Uh, I personally had my first flight uh, teaching position at a part 141 school, which had the benefit of the 141 syllabus program. 141 is a great way for someone brand new to get into the uh, process and the routine that's uh, well-developed. And uh, certainly you wanna be using a syllabus, a written syllabus to guide yourself when you start instructing. Communication skills, I'd like to add a word about that. Uh, David made the terrific point about, uh, oh, actually Rod made the terrific point about learning communication from a lot of different sources. Uh, you may be familiar with the group called Toastmasters. It's near free. It is a community organization where people get together just to polish their speaking skills. And they might have some strange assignment like explain how to boil an egg in a half an hour, I mean, in a half a minute or something. But it allows you to build your skills and confidence speaking in front of others. So if you feel like that's a weak point for you, you could go join uh, your local breakfast or lunch Toastmasters group and you'll get a lot out of it. Um, okay, well that's some sage advice from you guys. I really like the one about shredding your uh, shredding your flight plans and getting down to, to the real work of flight instructing. And obviously uh, getting in a mentorship program or finding someone you admire could be extremely helpful to someone, especially when they're starting out with flight instructing. I, I really like the reference to my favorite physicist and I would, I would second Rod on that. If there's anybody looking to be, see how knowledge transfer really should be done, find some of his old YouTube videos. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore, but he's a, he's a fine example of how knowledge transfer should be done. Uh, I think and we Russ, have just, a, just yeah, go ahead. Uh, sure. as, for, as for observation, I, I just have to say, Greg's, oh, sorry, that's that way. Uh, Greg's point <laughs> is excellent uh, for Toastmasters because I was out on the speaking circuit uh, speaking professionally, but I'd still attend Toastmasters. It was that valuable an experience and it's all free. Uh, and it's, it, you, you associate with professional people and it gives you a chance to prove, uh, improve. Feedback was just phenomenal. So I, I think that's a, a, just a great observation. Well, well but said see how and, many and good advice. Things. Yeah, but they're also non-aviation related. They're, they're out in the field. They're, you know, um, skills that aren't related to what people have been doing. They really have to break away from that narrow world of aviation and expand their communication. And, that's, you know, that's a good very and I, and just to add, world. To, to add to what you yeah, just right. said, David, a big part of selling our services is hanging around with people who aren't already pilots. So Very good. And a place like, seriously, a place like Toastmasters, you meet a whole bunch of people, get to know them, and you happen to be the flight instructor in the group. So you should always view those things as a dual opportunity, improve yourself, but make contacts and sell some flight training while you're at it. Yeah, There's where, our where, exactly. where, where do student pilots come? Yeah, they no. come from non-pilots. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. Okay, well, we, we've got, a, we've got a, a question or two coming in on the internet, so let's uh, send it over to the disembodied voice, Ethan. And Ethan, read us the question. Let's see what we've got, and we'll uh, take a stab at it. We have a question from Robert J. on Twitter. He says, how do you know when you're ready to be an instructor? Okay. okay. That's a this, tough one. Uh, first person to speak gets it. Okay, <laughs> I'll try. Uh, my, my observation is, is this. Assuming that uh, a, a person has basic common sense, and you know what I mean by that, common sense is you never buy a TV from a man on a street corner who's out of breath, or you know, never borrow money from anybody named Dominic. <clears throat> but the point is that that it, thank you, I'll be here all week. Uh, the, uh, the 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 thing that's important to keep in mind is. If a person has, if, if I could dis, uh, identify one characteristic that would make a good instructor, and um, this would be from the uh, decision point of should I become a CFI or not, and that is, do you like teaching people? Do you like sharing your knowledge with other people? And if that 
is something that you like doing, I believe that will provide the vehicle, the momentum, and the drive to get you through the, the training process. Because if you don't like teaching folks, you really need to be somewhere else, not in the cockpit. You have to like people and you have to like sharing what you know. And those two are so fundamental, at least uh, in my opinion, I think they're important. And Great. to an as an sorry, I didn't know if I was live or not here. As an adjunct to that, uh, I agree a hundred percent with Rod. And I would add, a lot of us feel like we're not ready to be an instructor for the same reason. It's so hard to prepare for a knowledge test. Uh, you know that um, you uh, we never all know everything we think we should know, but you reach a journeyman point pretty quickly where you have a whole lot more knowledge than someone who is new. And I would say at the point where you're a pretty confident pilot doing your own flying, you're certainly ready technically to uh, uh, start down an instructor in teaching. Don't feel like you have to be master of the universe to get there. Yeah, and the other thing that's that, so essential you know, to that is, it, I'm sorry, David, go right ahead. Excuse me. No, go ahead, Rod. You got it. I was going to say Richard Bach said in his book Illusions many years ago, and it's one of those phrases that just sticks in the psyche, sticks in mind because there's a lot of room up there. And that phrase is, we teach best what we need to learn most. And that's yeah. from uh, Jonathan Lipton Siegel, I believe. And so essentially, you know, when a person becomes a flight instructor, they'll learn, uh, well, they'll learn how much they don't know about aviation, first of all. And then they'll teach people to fly and they'll learn there are like 80 different ways uh, to do stalls because you have 80 different students and the learning curve is phenomenal. So you, Greg is absolutely correct. You can't expect to, to know everything. You just have to assume if you have common sense, you'll find your way through it. You'll figure it out. Yeah, I was just going to second what Greg said about, you know, people think to be a CFI master of the universe, this huge body of knowledge. And I think what you said, Rod, is, is much more important is that somebody is a good teacher they're passionate about it. They've got a warm heart. They want to share. People always ask me, you know, who should they choose for a flight instructor? And that's sort of the same thing. You start to look around and you go, this guy has great technical proficiency, but can he communicate? Is he bringing his, his point across? You know, I really look for the good teacher much more than the uh, polymath in uh, information. Just because they can, like I said, put the lift equation on the board. It's not going to help them really communicate basic flying skills. Mm -hmm. Well, that is that is absolutely so true. If, if you had to define, uh, break it down even further, if I could uh, list one quality uh, for a good CFI, that would be uh, a person of good character. Because if they're good character, whether they can fly, you know, hey, listen, if they they can land on the runway, preferably the one that they were aiming at, uh, and they can they can do that consistently. If they can communicate, they can teach me to fly at least as well as they do. So that's a great point. Great point. Yeah. I Russ is appreciate it. Oh, let's go. let's move on to our next canned question, or we'll be here all night. Okay, <laughs> the unseemly topic of money. It does cost money in order to learn to fly and to earn a pilot certificate, and it's something people might tiptoe around and feel uncomfortable about. So the question is, how should we as CFIs best talk price to sell prospective customers? Greg, this one goes to you. Thank you, kind sir. <laughs> well, I'd like to first point out how flight training has been sold for decades. It's been sold based on an hourly rate, you know, an hourly rental rate for the airplane, a charge for the instructor. And the person going to the prospective pilot might visit a few flight schools and one school charges one rate and another school charges another rate. And in the absence of other information, they're trying to figure out whether it's better to pay $25 an hour here versus $30 an hour there. I think we've moved past that because flying is pretty expensive on a lesson by lesson basis. Uh, you start getting into a couple hundred bucks a lesson and that sounds very expensive and it is expensive compared to some things. So I'd like to propose a little paradigm shift here. I'm thinking about this. If we could have that, uh, that first uh, slide there. There was, a, uh, there was an ad up in our local homeowner's mail room for a used ATV for $13,000. Now, we know that flight training at 10, 11, $12,000 is not inexpensive, but 
what's a more valuable thing to have, a used ATV or the rest of your life filled with adventures as a pilot? And so I simply have listed a few things here. A kitchen remodel for most people is gonna cost double what a pilot's license costs. Look at what motorcycles cost these days. A teardrop camping trailer might be 15 grand. So we got to get off of this idea that we can't mention what it really costs because it actually frees us to discuss all those hourly rates don't mean anything. What matters is you're going to make an investment of around $10,000 and you need to do a little planning for it, just like you do for the motorcycle or for the kitchen remodel. And that's a good thing for customers to know. Now, once we've had that discussion, we can get on to the more individual pricing issues. And uh, Ethan, if we could have the next one, please. As soon as we get into the value of this whole thing as a package value, the pricing per hour diminishes in value. But we've got to give them some reference, right? And we're all accustomed to this. You know, everyone watching knows that the FAA minimums do not reflect the cost of learning to fly. So what I recommend you do is you show your prospective customer two prices. You give them a breakdown of the FAA minimums, which is technically and theoretically possible. And then next to it, you show them a fully itemized list with the examiner fees and everything that you really believe will go there. And, and you can say our flight school, we anticipate most people are going to take around 50 hours, could be more, but you show them that. Now they've got a kind of a range they fall in and it raises the obvious questions about, well, how, what determines where I fall in that range? And that's the opportunity to talk with them about things like if you prepare for lessons, it's going to save you money. And another thing to consider is not everybody wants the cheapest plane or the cheapest instructor. So you want to differentiate your instructor rates and your airplane rental rates and you want to give your clients, your prospective clients, the option of, well, you can fly this 150 over here for $100 an hour, or you can fly a new 172 for 140 over here. And uh, there's going to be a batch. We're going to check, choose the uh, 172. And also, you want to have your instructors stratified in rate so your most senior people, you charge more for them. And there are going to be certain people who say, I want to pay a premium for the best instructor you've got. And there will be others who say, I'm on a tight budget. How can I do this most affordably? Now, charging lump sum, we know, is a kind of a risky, tough business in aviation to, to package a whole private pilot, let's say, at a price because people don't need it. But consider charging by phases. If you package a phase, say a solo phase, you can call it, you can give it a range. It doesn't have to be a single hard price. You could have them put uh, half down on the solo phase and then half later. And anyone who's ever been in consulting knows you have an agreement that says, I'll let you know in writing if, if you're not going to make this. You know, you got to let people know if it's not going to work. But the importance of this is if someone has a bad lesson, instead of saying, oh, darn it, now I got to go back tomorrow and spend another 200 bucks for another horrible experience. Instead, they've already paid for, they're committed to this phase. And of course, the day after they solo is not the day they're going to quit. So then you, then you do the next phase. You know, Greg, what you uh, said about value is, uh, is interesting to me because the, uh, uh, for AOPA, <clears throat> many years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, I wrote an article called Reluctant Moms and Dads. And the article's premise was to explain why moms and dads should spend money to help their child obtain a, a pilot certificate. And that was the genesis of that was my discussion with a, a mom who had a, a youngster and she was thinking about investing in his flight training. I think he was about maybe 17, 16, 17. So I, I phrased it like this and you, you said, sell the value. And I think sometimes we, we forget to do that. And the value for me, looking at that young person, I said this, I said, aviation is a very communal activity. 
Uh, and when you associate with people in aviation, typically you're associating with people who aren't the uh, who, who have been qualified in some way, shape or form. They tend to be more mature. They tend to be more focused. Uh, they tend to be more professional as a general rule, in particular flight instructors. So uh, who would you rather have your child hang around with? And associate with and that would be somebody that uh, is in the aviation community trying to aspire toward professional standards or you want to send them to a rock band school so they can not that there's anything with rock band school people but <clears throat> let's be fantastic here flight instructors don't destroy hotel furniture so um in in this case you find yourself a nice uh, you know, if you have a rock band school, you send them there, maybe they might not learn the same values that they'll learn by going to flight instructors or, or hanging around the airport learning to acquire aviation skills. And I'll tell you, she bought it. And I, I realized it was such a powerful motivator. So it's a, just sell the sizzle, not the steak. There's the value. And it gives people uh, something, a much easier way to convince people that aviation is a good deal compared to the, well, relatively speaking. And we posted that article at our flight school and used it for 10 years because it was so valuable. There's so many oh, intangible so nice. benefits. There's Thank so many you. intangible you benefits to a pilot certificate for a young person, builds character, good medical, you know, they've got to keep clean. I mean, good friends. I mean, it is a wonderful, uh, valuable. And I think you're right. Everyone just puts a dollar value on when will I solo and how much will it cost and all the other parts have to be conveyed. I think that's that's primary if we're going to stay alive. Thank you, Dave. You you are now my new best friend. Uh, Greg's number two now. So uh, darn. I do. <laughs> well, we were selling his Thank book, you. so. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, Touche. Let, let, let me step into this bromance and let's continue on. <laughs> uh, the next, oh, the next question funny. is kind yeah. of a follow up to what we were down. just talking about. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> it's kind of a follow up to what we were talking about before having to do with uh, fees. And we do have a couple of questions coming in from viewers. Hang with us. After this question, we're going to go in and hit some more of those. But this question in particular is a follow on. So how can a flight instructor make a reasonable living in the flight training business? Rod, take it away. Happy to take that one. Um, here's the deal. When you first become a flight instructor, typically you just don't have a lot of flight training skills. Uh, therefore, when you uh, start working, you're working for an FBO probably, and as a result, um, you are not only being paid maybe, let's say, $15 an hour. In some cases, that's if you're lucky. And uh, okay, fine. But you're also being paid in another way, and it's called remuneration, recompense. What you're doing is you're building experience and you're building flight time. And those are factors we don't normally figure when it figure in when it comes to evaluating our total recompense package. Therefore, you're learning the craft of flight instruction. Now, you're probably going to have to spend a couple of years doing that, maybe two years uh, to become uh, capable enough so that all of a sudden your, hey, I got to fly with that guy reputation starts kicking in. And once it starts doing that, now you're in a position to be able to have, uh, by word of mouth, generating your own students and you're doing it by word of mouth which means you must have something to sell you must have some skills you must have some chops and uh, flight instruction chops and therefore um, you are now in a position to start making a much better living and what happens is this um, the, uh, the, the the basic idea is this you want to grow toward being an independent flight instructor if you're working for somebody else Always remember this, you have to be making them more money than they're paying you. <laughs> so consequently, that's a natural ceiling on what you can make. Now, I said grow toward being an independent instructor. Uh, in some cases, you can grow toward being an independent CFI and do so on the airport because there are no um, local rules that prohibit that. Now, in many cases, you can do the same thing, but do it within the FBO because the FBO typically takes a large chunk of your money. But what you do is this. Keep in mind, you're, they're taking a large chunk of their money, or of your money, because they're providing you with students. Now, your strategy should be to get your own students. And you say, well, how shall I do that? Well, if you had read this book right here, The Savvy Flight Instructor by Greg <laughs> Brown. Greg Brown says, and I think this is, it's such a, a great thing, and it's exactly what I did as a flight instructor. Hold on, let me do this. My doctor says I'm now three lenses away from being a fly, so um, I have to put these on to read. But Greg Brown says, becoming a fast team 
representative and or hosting and presenting seminars elevates you another step. Wouldn't pilots rather fly with the expert presenting the seminar than just a regular flight instructor? Become that expert if you can. That's the, that was the single most important thing that helped me gain students as a flight instructor. I realized I had to learn how to speak. So I started teaching ground school, which by the way, was very lucrative uh, back in the early 1970s. And strangely enough, it's still lucrative in the 2017s. And then um, I went to Toastmasters, by the way, great observation, uh, again, by uh, Greg. And, and I reaffirmed or re reinforced my uh, good speaking skills and hopefully got rid of the bad ones. But here's the key. I had more students than I knew what to do with. Why? Because I was developing safety seminar programs, speaking in front of uh, individuals, and the FAST team folks just love to have you. They, you know, in many cases, they have a hard time getting enough people to present. And your strategy should be to develop one program. No, not five, not 10, one. One magnificent, uh, I, I was going to say killer program, but I guess that wouldn't be the right choice of words. One superlative, powerful program that gets people to attend and they ask their friends to attend. They watch you perform. They'll come back for more. And folks, you hand out your business card. That leads you to independence. And now you can uh, make a deal with the FBO and say, listen, uh, I'm bringing in my own students. You don't have to expend resources to bring me students. Uh, how about taking a smaller cut of what I offer and perhaps maybe 5%, 10% instead of 30%. In essence, you're operating independently. You're making a lot more money and in the cliff note version, that's how it's done. I, I'll second you on that. Uh, Russ, okay? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's all, it's all the the idea of the ground school opportunities, most flight instructors, oh. new flight instructors, they don't want to teach ground school. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of money to be made there. Everybody in the class is paying for it. And as oh, you man. mentioned, Rod, you can make a deal with the flight school that you're working for and take a cut because they need ground school classes. Um, so that's one area. Another thing, a couple things I would also add in terms of making a living at this, you got to charge for ground. It's just apps. You can leave this up because I'll get right into this, but you must charge for ground instruction. It's important because it makes your students study to save money. And it's important because you need the money and you don't want to cut them short. And secondly, you must charge an adequate rate. Um, so let's go back to that last one, please. So another step that I'll build on here is you need to keep your schedule full. So you need to have a policy for people who don't show a fine or some, some, uh, reason why they're going to want to show. If you're working for a flight school that's got staff, you want to give them a reward for filling canceled lessons. It's really important. Uh, That's a great idea. Uh, I had a dentist one time who told his staff that if they kept 80% of the appointments filled for the year, he would take them to Hawaii. And he did it every year for like 10 years. Now, most flight schools can't make a trip to Hawaii, but you could give someone a free lesson a month if they keep the lessons filled at a certain level. But you want incentives for that. Twitter and Facebook are really great ways to let people know that, hey, you've been trying to get a lesson with Rod, he's been really busy, but he just had a cancellation in two hours. You might be able to fill it. Another thing is on weather days, you gotta have plans, whether it's through the simulator or using a PC to teach more, doing ground instruction, and then finally, Drop customers who are costing you money. It takes a lot of guts to do that. But if you see it happening, <clears throat> refer them to somebody else and get rid of them. Okay, I think I had one more there that's real quick. Uh, I just want to make the point, again, that not every customer is the same. So there are people who want to save money, and there are people who are glad to spend money. And one great thing to offer is, and you could make a sign with this even, is to offer... Be sure people know that there are additional lessons beyond the syllabus they can take that will teach them valuable skills that they can invest in. And I think you'll be surprised how many people, even on a budget, will decide it's worth an extra lesson to go land at a real grass strip or go up on a day with tough crosswinds or, or uh, go to a pancake fly-in and learn collision avoidance. So be sure they know they can have these things and offer them to your customers. 
And Greg, just a quick observation. I'm sorry, Dave. I, I, let, let me just throw this in real quick. Uh, the idea of having billable hours is ex extremely important. Listen, if you can't make a living at it, you, you got to go do something else. So uh, you, you got to make a living at it. And what I did was uh, once I started getting a little business sense in the uh, late 1970s, um, I did this with students. I had every student agree. Uh, and I used to have them write this down, but I just went into a verbal contract. You have to fly three lessons with me a week two hours each lesson. And uh, the two hour lesson would either be flying or it would be ground instruction. Uh, if the weather's bad, we do ground instruction. I had to have the guarantee of billable income. And the benefit the student gets is they get me uh, as their flight instructor, assuming that you know, I'm doing a good job and I certainly try to. So the, the issue there is, think about this, uh, three students a day, six billable hours a day. And in the early 1980s, I was charging 35 an hour which was a, a good sum back then. So that roughly equates to about $200, uh, 210 a day. And that would be over a five day period, that's $1,000. Uh, and that is billable, good income. Students agreed to do it. And we didn't have to fly if the weather was bad. Uh, we did ground instruction. And sometimes I do six days a week, but five days a week is a, was a, a good amount for me, although many times I did six. And the income wasn't bad. And if somebody didn't fulfill that, just like you say, then I had to let them go and put somebody else in the slot. And it worked really well for me, but I had to stand fast and make sure that they adhered to the two hours a day, <clears throat> three lessons a week, or two hours per lesson, three lessons per week. Okay. But it really brings up the point, what both of you guys are saying, it's, it's almost like, you know, people get the CFI certificate and they don't realize they're not just a flight instructor, they're running a business. They got to think oh, about true. insurance. They got to think about accounting. They've got to think about all those items. And uh, really, uh, that's one of the reasons SAFE put in that insurance program we have is so many people go out there and once they break out on their own, they're not covered under the FBO's insurance. But it's so much more than just, you know, being a CFI. You're a business. And so both you guys have obviously leveraged that very successfully and continue to do so. Yeah. And by the way, SAFE is a great organization for uh, anybody to join. You you do great work over there. And you have uh, you, Doug Stewart, and all the other wonderful folks you have working for you. But David, yeah. you're, you've grabbed the helm and you've uh, you've uh, guided it very, very well here. So very impressive. And everybody uh, who's a CFI or uh, aspiring to be a CFI uh, should join. It's important. Thank you. Okay, guys, let's keep let's keep it moving on here. The next question we have is, is, is an important one, and it goes right along with what you just finished discussing. It's going to get into marketing, but we do have a lot of people queuing up with some online questions. So let's let's put Ethan back on board here. Let's put him in charge and let's take a couple of those and see what people are asking. All right. We have a question here uh, from Mike Honcho. It says, why does the CFI initial have such a low pass rate? Hello from California Aeronautical University. Well, May I answer that one? Uh, <clears throat> Go for it. Can I give that a, can I give that a first shot? Uh, Yours. As, <laughs> has been point, as has been pointed out by uh, virtually everybody here, the, the key thing that makes you successful as a flight instructor, of course you have to have knowledge and skills, but the key uh, element is teaching. And uh, people who have any kind of teaching experience have, uh, are ahead when it comes to CFI oral, which is the hard part. The hard part's not in the airplane. It's, in, it's teaching. In the and so there's a couple things you can do. First, it's worth mentioning some of you older people, more, you know, more mature types uh, it, who have teaching experience teaching anything, literally anything, firefighting, to uh, graphic design, they're going to do better on the test than someone who's never taught anything before. Uh, so any opportunity you have to teach is going to help you. But I would like to make this suggestion. This is what I recommend my CFI students do. Prior to your check ride, when you're done with all your prep, find a friend or family member who would like to take a first lesson and knows nothing about it. Take them out to the airport and give them the entire first lesson. Obviously, you can't charge for it. They can't log it, but you can legally fly from the right seat. You can teach them that first lesson, and it should be the first one. Show them how the flight controls work, explain the principles, and just see how they react. Because when you go meet the examiner, this is what the examiner wants to see. And I found this really helps. Just doing this one time right before your check ride is a really great way to prepare yourself 
for the, the mindset to pass the oral on the CFI check ride. Yeah, yeah that's a great okay. I, <laughs> advice. It reminds me of, uh, I had a, a lady friend when, uh, when I was first learning to the, become a flight instructor and uh, I would do the same thing on her. I'd say, uh, sit down, I want to teach you VOR. She said, I, I don't want to learn VOR. I said, well, uh, you're going to learn VOR. I got to teach you VOR. VOR. And so I worked my VOR uh, explanations on her, which uh, explains why two weeks later she was no longer my girlfriend. But um, the, the point there is that uh, when you take a CFI check, well, no, it's not the point. But the, a, a point that's worth considering is this. Uh, the number of people, since I'm going to speak directly to the question now, the number of people that actually take a CFI check right and do so with the intent of showing the FAA examiner um, whether they can you know, turn the wheel, um, whether they can pull the wheel back and forth and do a little of this, and most people don't know what this is. Uh, and so consequently, that's not what the examiner wants to see. The whole purpose of a CFI check ride is to show that you can teach. And the moment you walk in to take that examination, you treat the examiner as a student. You give no quarter. You uh, you assume that person is a student. Assume, and, you know, obviously not the moment you walk in, but when the role playing starts and you do not let go of that biscuit. You hold on to it, hold that bone in your mouth and you keep teaching all the time. In other words, you're talking to this person, you're saying, okay, listen, I need more experience of, of, about you. I don't know that much about you. How about telling me about a little bit, a bit about your background? Do you like to um, uh, hear more explanations before you go out and give it a try? And then you use demonstration, performance, teaching method, and all the other things you learn in the flight instructor handbook. Your job is not to convince the person you can fly. You have a commercial license. They already know you know how to do that. What they want to see is that you know how to teach. And, and I'll add just one very quick word to that, uh, not to step on David here, but if a question arises, I 100% agree with Rod, you got to take command and be the instructor. If a question is asked of you and you're thinking, is, is he asking me as the instructor or is he, or is he asking me as the examiner? Does he want to know if I know this or is he being the student? Then ask them that, say to them, hey, are you asking me that as the examiner, as my examiner, or are you asking me that as my student? So because there's a real, a lot of room for error there if, if you're not sure well, you what, what the role is. I'll put on my examiner hat here for just a second. And, you know, I would say going to that question, if 80% if of the people are failing on an initial tech check ride, it's not the applicant's fault. It's the flight instructor that's sending them. Obviously, they're not preparing them well. There is a school right there in Van Nuys. It's called CFI Boot Camp. They take people from all over the country. And, okay, and they run them right through this very rigorous syllabus. I think it's three weeks. And there's blood on the floor. They really work them. There's a bunch of guys that do the right seat conversion. There's a bunch of guys that do the uh, teaching part. And they have like an 80 90% pass rate. So, I mean, it can be done, but it, it requires good instruction. And then when you send the person, you've got to be, you know, sending a qualified applicant. I think too many people just throw applicants at, at examiners and see how it's going to go. That's yeah. really not what we want to see. <laughs> That's mm. very disappointing for everyone. Mm. Okay, so true. let's move on. We've got it. We've got another uh, viewer question. Let's go ahead and, uh, and take that. And Mike, thanks for that question. We appreciate it. All right, we have another question here from uh, Chris F. in New York on Twitter. He says, I believe instructors need to be brutally honest and trustworthy, but I've known several that are not. Do you agree? No. Oh, gosh. Yes, of course. I don't think... Yeah, the <laughs> instructors are people. And just like, you know, there are good doctors and bad doctors, good airline pilots, bad airline pilots, there are good flight instructors and bad flight instructors. And if you don't believe that, uh, go to my website, go to the blog and read my article bad instructors. And all it is, Great. is the genesis, the spawning of one question, the spawn of one question that I posed on Facebook several years ago. And that question was, uh, have you ever had an inst a bad instructor? And I just left it at that. And folks, the responses are unbelievable. Now, that doesn't mean every instructor is bad. And I don't want to give that impression at all. Uh, the vast majority of instructors do great work. The fact is, though, that the bad ones give the good ones a bad name. And if you want to see how bad they, they can be, take a look at the, uh, that, that blog piece I wrote. And so to answer your question, there are bad instructors. That's why I wrote the article 
uh, in my blog, blog piece called How to Find a Good Flight Instructor. And I will say this unequivocally, unequiv unequiv you know what I'm trying to say, unequivocally, <laughs> that the single most important thing, in fact, let, let's do this. If I can do a behavioral science intervention experiment, take your finger, put it in your ear. No, I want everybody in the audience to do that. It, you, you guys can do it too, if you like. I didn't think I'd get you guys to do it, but uh, put it in your ear because what I'm about to say is so important. I don't want it to go in one ear and out the other. And what I want to say is this, that the secret to your success as a student is to find a good flight instructor. As the old Chinese saying goes, and it sounds better in the original Chinese, it's better to spend three years looking for a good instructor than to spend three minutes with a bad one. Nothing, 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 nothing is more important than that. And that's why good instructors that get a good reputation have all the business they could possibly ever want. My two cents. Okay, do we yeah, have I just three cents? To, yeah, just pop okay. that question up one more time, Ethan. You got that? The thing I saw there that just cued me in is it's okay to be honest and trustworthy, but I don't think brutally has to be in there. You know, the bedside manner, I think, is always important. I and, second that. You know, yeah, you spend a lot of time as an instructor telling people things. You don't want to sugarcoat it to the point that, the, that it doesn't get across, but I've seen a lot of instructors that are harsh, and, and that's not necessary, so mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't go that far. It, it drives people away. I mean, uh, this is hard stuff we're doing, and if you leave the lesson feeling like an idiot, you're not coming back. So yeah. who does that serve? Yeah, it doesn't serve the instructor or the student. Do we have more I questions? Think, or? I think one thing that we, that we as flight instructors should always remember, and, I, and I've seen this too, some flight instructors think of themselves more like drill sergeants, but we have to remember, we work for the client. It's not the other way around. Yeah. So sure. some That's amount of decorum and, and good sense in your delivery is worthwhile. We still got some more questions coming in, but we've got a really important one that you guys, that we all came up with together. And I think a lot of people would like to hear about this one. So uh, Greg, this one's gonna be for you. Please share tips on modern mar marketing methods for CFIs. Okay, and I'm gonna just zip through some of this because uh, you could write a whole book on this very easily on this, this topic alone. If we could have the, uh, the first slide there, Ethan. Uh, a lot of people ask, well, what's the minimum stuff I need to support my marketing? And the two things you need, and this is, we determined this through quite a bit of research and working on the latest edition of the book. You need a website and, and photo business cards at absolute minimum. You must have those. And I'll tell you why. Brochures, paper brochures are largely gone. Your website is your brochure. And I think a lot of us, because of the nature of social media, we tend to kind of write off websites as not being relevant to our daily lives. But think about it. If you're looking for a place to learn to fly or to get your shoes fixed or almost anything else, you're going to Google it. So when you talk to successful flight schools, we found out that uh, they figure about 90% of their business comes from their website, from people they don't know who Googled it and said, I want to learn to fly in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, they found it on the website. Now, business card is critical because it is still a tool you need when you meet someone that will send them to your website. So you want to have a QR code on there, uh, as I got pictured on the side, so they can take the card home, and this will take them, not only connect them to you and, if you have a, and your social media page if you've got it, but to your website. Okay, next. All right. Now, let's talk about some other digital marketing tools. People are really into pictures these days. They're really into Facebook. You've got to, have, you've got to be taking pictures of your clients in action anytime you see a great opportunity, not just when they solo, but if there's a great shot of them working around the airplane or pre-flighting or a view out the window. You want to provide those pictures to your clients to put on their Facebook pages because it makes them proud they have a degree of commitment they develop with their friends that they're going to finish, and it brings you new business. Social media sites are most valuable for this. It's for keeping the customers you have and helping your customers sell your services. Now, here's where a blog or e-newsletter comes in if you have time to do it. Those are useful to keep prospects alive. So if you got someone who thinks they want to learn to fly, but they're not going to have the money for six months, 
blog, newsletter, that's something if they sign up, they're going to be reminded monthly. The same is true if they get a free subscription to Flight Training Magazine, by the way. You want something knocking on their door every month saying, time to call David and start, set up lessons. Now I get to say, why am I wearing this silly outfit with all these airplanes all over it and my only bola tie I've ever been able to find that says, I fly a beach craft. <laughs> I don't. So but nice. <laughs> but the, the point is, uh, People see me wearing a, a, a beach crap bowl tie or a shirt with airplanes on, they're going to ask me what I do. You need to be wearing aviation-related clothing, a hat. It can be any kind of aviation you want because you want people to approach you, whether you're at the gym or at the grocery store, and say, hey, are you involved with flying? I always wanted to do that. It's, it's really a very valuable thing. Now, if you stay at home all the time, it won't help much. But you should be wearing aviation-related clothing every time you go out. Let's go back to, the, to that slide, please. News releases, that's another story, and I'm gonna skip that one right now. The only reason to print something is if you're going to be doing uh, like community trade shows and so on. And then you can, for, for under $100, you can print some three or four fold flyers that provide an introduction and send people to the website that you can hand them at these gatherings. Okay, next. This ties in with what I said earlier. You want your clients to help sell your services. So you want stuff that makes them visible on social media and anything you give them uh, as premiums or whatever should have aviation, uh, should be something their friends are going to see and ask them about flying. And I'd like to mention, in addition to the obvious accomplishments like first solo and solo cross country, there are some other, so, uh, other accomplishments that are hugely important to people that we don't recognize. Anybody know what a baby's first lap ceremony is? We live on the edge of the Navajo Nation. And Gene and I have had the pleasure of getting to know some Diné people. And they have this wonderful ceremony called the baby's first lap ceremony. What happens is the first person who gets a baby to laugh hosts a party celebrating it and everyone comes. Now think about that. You've been feeding this baby and changing diapers. We, many of us have been there and it's a lot of work. But the first day the baby smiles at you, that's a human being. Think about somebody, how they feel when they do their first greaser landing. The first time they have some kind of a problem and overcome it, a plane blocked the runway, they had to go to a different runway or a different airport. These are things that are huge to our clients. And each one offers an opportunity to laud them on social media and give them some kind of recognition that others will see. Next, please. Diane Johnson got done with her training. She picked up four or five different decals, including some with lettering, includes this aviatrix thing that she stuck on her car. She's uh, actually uh, working on her CFI now up in Idaho. And uh, uh, she posted this in our pep talk group that some of you know about. I can't tell you how many people, how many women all wanted to know where they could get this aviatrix decal. This is the sort of thing that you can provide to your clients when they solo or when they get their license. They're going to advertise that they're pilots and people are going to say, where did you learn? How did you do that? Well, I went to Rod Machado at ABC Flight School. Next. People are really into video in the cockpit. This is my buddy, Matt Rhodes. This is the picture he posted when he soloed. And you can see the, uh, he's got the GPS tracker. And I'm amazed that he was willing to show this since he's not very complimentary of his face, right? This is stuff that people love to hear about. He posts this on his website. Some of his friends want to learn to fly. Next. I, I want to close this section by just pointing out that we tend to think very narrowly about who wants to become a pilot. And traditionally, it's been white males. And we need to get out of that mindset. There are opportunities to uh, target our marketing and our materials and our activities to bring in people from many different walks of life and many different 
ethnicities and interest groups and age groups. And those are all potential customers for us. If we don't start seeing more minorities around the airport, more older people learning to fly, more young kids learning to fly, we're going to have a real serious problem. And it's largely a matter of letting them know we welcome them to do this. Okay. And, We've been and to our, we're, into our, we're into our first hour here. We've got a lot of questions coming in. So if you don't mind, let's go ahead and try to take some more of those user questions. And my suggestion would be, uh, so, we, so we can get a lot of these answered. Whoever, whoever tags up and grabs a question, let that, one, let that one be answered, and then we'll move on to the next question, because we want as, as many people to be heard as possible. Now, one question that came in was, who is Russ Still and what is Gold Seal? So uh, I, your humble moderator here, am Russ Still. I'm a CFI, a career CFI, um, a six-time master CFI, and, and operate and founded the Gold Seal Online Ground School uh, Network. We have a private pilot online ground school, and actually we're the first company to have a private pilot online ground school on the internet. Uh, started in 2006, and, and flight instructors may join the program for free. That way you can evaluate it, take a look, see if it's something you'd like your students to use. And if they do, you can monitor your students through the program and monitor, watch their progress, get good quiz reports. Uh, you can even print out PDFs showing quiz questions they missed. It's, it's very, uh, very sophisticated. So I would invite you to go take a look at onlinegroundschool.com. Uh, so that's about me and that's about my program. Let's go ahead, Ethan, and move on to that next question. I think Dave had a question, Russ. Dave had something you wanted to say? Dave, well, I go just ahead. wanted to say I just wanted to say, you know, you see how Greg Brown lays that stuff out and I can just you can tell the value of his book. I mean, he's just got that mind that says this is how you market it. It's wonderfully valuable and it's all there. So uh, you know, he, he, and by the way, Russ Thank you. <laughs> R Russ also I, has I, I, something. Go ahead, Greg. I'm sorry. Well, I, I actually, we, we're probably on the same track here, Rod. I want to, while Russ introduced himself, I want to laud. Uh, he's on a new program with Gold Seal on the instrument, I believe is the only one yet, uh, where uh, they've come up with this very clever algorithm where you're taking practice test questions for the written. It gets rid of questions that you're answering consistently right so that it narrows your focus, something that otherwise we use you know, various devices to accomplish as instructors. And the other really cool thing is he's come up with this game where people can compete against themselves and others on answering these questions. So it really makes it fun. And based on a test that was done in our pep talk group, uh, it's very, very successful. So I just want to be sure people know about this great program he's got started. Yeah, and very, indeed, very, very kind of you guys. That, that instrument program is called goldmethod.com, but Online Ground School is Thank our you. basic uh, website into everything. And the branded ground school, Russ, is, is something that uh, people should know about because uh, the flood instructors can essentially have their own ground school as uh, sort of an affiliate through you. And uh, mm -hmm. it's financially uh, remunerative for them. So it's a great idea. So they should go to gold, uh, gold CL, uh, Online ground school .com, yeah. Online ground school and check that out. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It is, it is pretty unusual. Uh, Ethan, let's go ahead and move on to a uh, viewer question. What do we have? We have a question from Twitter here. It says, during initial CFI A training, what's the best approach or path in becoming a solid instructor? What is the examiner looking for? That might be a good one for Dave. Well, you know, I think we all could answer that. I mean, and and I, I, the other two guys answered it very nicely, which is they're looking to see that you can teach. You know, that is... It's you've proven yourself to be a pilot. You have a commercial. And when we're doing an initial CFI check ride, just what Rod said, which is uh, command authority, you have to demonstrate instructional authority. It's not like the examiner is going to pull the information out of you when it's an instructional check ride. You have to be totally in charge. You have to demonstrate that you can take command. And you know what he said in put the biscuit, you know, and don't let go of it. That is exactly what we're looking for. And instructional knowledge is also comprehensive. It's not like little parts that you can look up. So you really do need to master a lot of material. But being able to communicate, being able to teach, those are skills that are a little alien to most aviators. And to be successful in the instructional part, you have to That's master a good problem that. To have. It's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. I would to just add, add to that. To that uh, go ahead, Rod, please. Well, I I was just going to say, uh, to add to that, uh, there's a, a little technique I discovered many years ago that uh, 
uh, turned out to be very helpful for my CFI applicants, and it's called Logbook Archaeology. And uh, I just gave it that goofy little name. The, the idea was, if you want to see how people really learn in the real world, uh, ask to see their logbooks. You have an instrument student um, or you have a person who's instrument rated, ask to see their logbook. It shows you how they learned, uh, how they were taught. Uh, it shows you the things they went through, the steps they took and the progression that they, they made. Um, and you do that in order to learn how to best teach or better teach instrument students. Do that with private students, do that with CFI students, and excuse me, do that with private pilots, instrument pilots, flight instructors that already have their rating. If you can take a look at their logbook, watch what they did during training, and it gives you an idea of what really goes on in the real world for that particular person. But perhaps you can draw some general conclusions for that as to how you should structure your own syllabus. So, and I, I would uh, I would simply add, this is one rating where you wanna train from the best instructor you can. So even if it costs a few more bucks, you know, you, if you have a choice, pick someone who, who's widely, who's renowned as a great instructor, if you can, uh, because uh, it, it is critical stuff. Another thing is we've got all these resources online. Uh, people like Rod, like David, you can see how they instruct by going on and, and you know viewing their presentations. And there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube with people teaching. So when you're having a rough time, take a look at the, uh, at some of the resources, other people teaching these topics. Um, and I think you'll find it valuable. One last thing that I find a giveaway, a good, a good CFI instructor is going to have you teach every fundamental lesson for the private and the commercial as a practice ground lesson with a flight component. Anybody who is skipping some of that stuff for the ground training, it, skipping, saying, oh, Greg, you, you don't need to teach crosswind landings. We'll skip that one, just do a couple of them. You're gonna get cheated. You really want to teach every one of the topics to your instructor yes. and get the feedback. And to that end, Excellent. when people say, where can I buy uh, you know, a syllabus for my flight instructor program, if I may make an observation, uh, disabuse yourself of that idea and think about creating your own syllabus for every maneuver. You, 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 you can use other people's as a guide if you like, but you essentially have to create your own because by, put it this way, um, I never learned as much about thinking as I did when I started writing 27 years ago. Uh, because when you write, you have to think carefully about what it is that you're communicating. And the same thing occurs when you create your own syllabus. So uh, when I say syllabus, lesson plans, all the lesson plans for the uh, CFI rating. So uh, that would be my recommendation. Okay. Good. All right, let's move on. Uh, Rod. Back to you. What are the secrets to a successful intro flight, your first chance really to, uh, to get to know a student? Perhaps, that's a great question. Uh, perhaps the single most important thing that uh, uh, I could do as somebody that's introducing to somebody in aviation is to understand that uh, as a basic bedrock principle of psychology, almost everything we do in uh, situations that might cause anxiety is to look for some means of control. And so consequently, when somebody gets in an airplane, they don't have a means of control. Uh, they don't, they have control, there are controls there on the panel, but they don't know what they do. And so uh, hopefully the flight instructor does, student doesn't, and therefore they have no idea. They're completely at the mercy of the flight instructor. So as a flight instructor, what I do is I give them a sense of control. And what I do is I give them the power of uh, veto. And that means if, you know, if, if you're a Godfather fan, that has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, you know, the mafia. Uh, all this does is allows them to know that if they don't feel comfortable, they can come back. They can veto the flight. In other words, I tell them, listen, if anything feels uncomfortable to you, if you'd like to um, come back, if you want to stop doing anything that I am uh, doing at the moment, then just let me know and we will stop. You want to go back? We go back. Our objective is to have a lot of fun on this flight and introduce you to flying. And then I do what uh, I, I hope most people do, and that is I give them the controls, introduce them one at a time, assuming they're willing. I've never had anybody refuse to do that as long as it's done in a progressive, uh, gentle, non-threatening manner. And as soon as they know they can actually control the airplane, that also gives them a, a, a deeper feeling of control. And those two things build 
trustworthiness. And ultimately, you're trying to make yourself a trust appear in their eyes as a trustworthy person, and therefore they feel much more comfortable with you. That would be my most important observation about the uh, the demo flight. You know, I, I want to just I could add one. Please, one please go point. ahead, David. Yeah. I've been diving in first too often here. No, that's okay. Um, and you could see that Rod Machado would give a really excellent discovery flight. But if you go to a, a, a st no, if you go to a standard flight school, who gets assigned the discovery flights? It's the junior flight instructor, probably the worst person. I think the discovery flight is probably the hardest thing to teach well. Um, it really takes a master to do it, you know, to control people's anxiety and fear. Most people get in there and they try to make it seem so complicated and it should be simple. Somebody walked into your flight school or into the FBO and they've already expressed a desire to want to fly. If you don't screw it up, they're going to sign up. And everyone, you know, is, is got all these different things, but just make it easy. Show them the controls, you know, have them move it, give them a little basic aerodynamics. And I like to make it like, um, a, you know, just a, a lesson, but compressed and simpler. And just about every time they're going to sign up because they already want to. You just have to facilitate their desires there. So I'll anyway. add a few thoughts to that also. Um, and if you don't mind, we'll, we'll go to my, I've got a slide for everything here, but this will be quick here. <laughs> my first, first uh, the slide I've got for this one, please, on intro flights, Ethan. When you can... If someone comes in and has a discovery flight that's 20 minutes, try and con convince them of the value of investing in an hour and getting a proper first lesson, because otherwise it's hard to accomplish these other things. This is a place where you want to ask them right up front, what do you want to do with flying? And then you tailor the, the uh, intro flight to what they want to do. If, if they want to fly to their aunt's cottage, you emphasize cross country. If they want to, you know, whatever they want to do, you want to know ahead of time so you can demonstrate how they'll get to use it. You want to deliver each intro flight as if it's to your best friend. You would, you would try and make it special, right? And try and talk about pilots rather than students. Uh, emphasize what they'll be able to do as pilots over the process at this point. A key thing there that David just mentioned, well, actually both Brad and David did, uh, Customers should feel a bit of mastery when they leave to the degree that they'll feel like they've wasted the lesson if they don't continue. So you want them to fly the plane enough and give them simple enough tasks that they'll go home and say, you know, Bill or Martha, I, I flew the plane myself and I, I actually had my first lesson and I, that comes to the last issue here, schedule the next lesson before they leave. But you want them to think I'll waste today's lesson if I don't continue. And that takes a feeling of mastery. So go on one more, if you would, for me, Ethan. One more quick point. This is from Manny Peralta, an Australian flight instructor. It's his willing, able, and ready intro lesson checklist. And he says that if all three conditions are satisfied, there's a 90% chance that the individual will continue, with, will continue with lessons. So one, ask them about their interest in flying. The more demonstrated long-term interest they have, the better. Two, Will finances allow you to fly consistently if you start now? And three, can I book your next lesson for later today or should we do it next Saturday? Pretty darn good checklist. Yeah, that's a great checklist, Greg. In fact, uh, it, it was uh, Percy Whitey who wrote a wonderful book called The Five Great Rules of Selling many years ago. It's a classic. Uh, so classic that I, I I just can't find the book anymore. But it's a uh, it goes like this: five great rules are attention, interest, conviction, desire, and closure, and uh, it actually parallels uh, the basic teaching techniques to introduce almost any new lesson. But closure is the most important one, and uh, I think one statistic read: ninety five percent of all sales uh, never uh, succeed or sales uh, presentations never succeed because the sale is not asked for. You don't close the sale. So number three point is extremely important. Okay, we're moving along. Now I'd like to uh, invite people to continue sending in questions. We've got several queued up that we're gonna hit right now, but a reminder, stick with us because at the end of this presentation, we've got some really nice prizes to give away, but you have to be present to enter, so, uh, or to win. <laughs> So, Ethan, what do we got next for another question? Let's get. I'm afraid I'm definitely going to screw up this name. Ashley Neboshik on uh, Twitter asks, "What should I charge for an hourly wait? Uh, hourly rate?" <laughs> okay, thanks, 
Ashley. Ashley. Ashley, who wants to go for the uh, hourly rate question? It depends on the, st on the instructor, too. I, I think there's probably a lot of factors there. Well, I, I would think uh, my, my observation would be that uh, there is a, uh, um, a market medium that uh, probably has to be considered. In other words, what people are charging in your local area. Charge too much, and of course, uh, you uh, will probably lose a student. Not necessarily, but uh, you might charge too little, and uh, you uh, don't do yourself any service. So uh, my impression would be uh, to charge what would be appropriate for the service that you offer. Now, this is kind of a strange thing. Think about it. Um, that if you're a new CFI, you're not going to charge the highest rate, as Dave uh, originally said at the beginning of this program. You're going to charge probably or not going to be able to make the, 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 the biggest bucks that you'd like to make as a CFI. So you start off low and you work up high. But I know some CFIs in the uh, local area in Southern California that charge $100 an hour, $500 a day. And uh, they have more business than they know what to do with. And you know, the fact is that they've been busy. Well, they're as busy as they want to be. How can they be so busy? Simply that uh, they have the reputation th that allows people to fly in from all over the country to use their service. You think, why would I want to pay $100 an hour for a CFI? Because what you do is you get $100 per hour worth of effective training. And therefore, uh, maybe a CFI without the same skill who charges $30 an hour, maybe it would take five hours to receive the same amount of training. So my, uh, Leslie, my point to you is charge what you think you're worth, what the market will bear. And as you gain more skills, then um, I would say that uh, you are uh, you should raise your rate commensurate with those skills. And when I say charge what you think you're worth, charge what you feel comfortable charging, charge what you need to make a living, but uh, don't uh, short yourself by charging too little because you don't want to, uh, well, for whatever reason, you might not want to charge enough. You have to feel that you're worth it initially uh, to be able to ask for a certain fee. So don't short yourself in that way. And I would just add to that, uh, if you're in an area where you don't have any reference, like if you're starting a flight school in a place where there isn't one, take a look at what golf and tennis professionals charge. It'll give you some idea what what people are paying for other types of private lessons. And you'll probably be surprised at how high those rates are. And then also, as Rod mentioned, figure out what you need to make. Don't start below what you need to make. Uh, this yeah. is not a lost leader business. You you got to make money at it. So. That's the bottom, what you and need Greg, to make. Didn't, didn't you make the point before that if you charge too little, that psychological principle of, oh, he's charging very little, he must not be worth it. There is a principle there that you have to respect. You know, if you're, if you're a professional in the field, charge what you have to and, you know, uh, make sure that you're worth it. I, I'd like to say that, you know, people like Doug Stewart that have people fly in from all over the country, you know, they're really giving a value for that and they really they, work their butt off to make sure they deliver. <laughs> The only complaint that I have ever had on, on pricing, I've never had anyone say you charge too much, but there was a time when a neighbor of mine I had taught to fly uh, introduced me to a wealthy contractor friend who wanted to learn to fly. And, oh, Greg, he's such a great instructor, and he's been doing it for years, and it was a great experience. So uh, uh, the fellow lived right in my hometown. So I drove over there and picked him up at his house. We had never met. There's two Mercedes sports cars parked in the driveway. We went out to the airport. I took him to the cheapest airplane, which was a shabby 150, and we went up and flew it. And then after we landed, he, we went into the office. This was working for a flight school. And the, uh, the uh, owner of the flight school, you know, wrote out the bill and asked for money. And this guy wrote the check. And then he turned to me, the student turned to me and said, OK, Greg, and what's your fee? And I said, oh, well, well, it's in that other fee. And his face turned white, and he said, you mean that's all you make doing this? I have, I can see his face, but it was a great lesson. You don't want to be trying to save people money. You want to be fair and be good and have them feel they're paying for the best because their lives and their fun depend on you doing a great job. So they better believe you're worth it. Yeah. Sell the value. Yeah. And, and uh, just as another observation to that, uh, uh, the uh, highest charging or the uh, high rate instructor at one of our local flight schools. I think he was charging about $90 an hour at the time. Uh, his, uh, I, I loved his ex explanation when people would say, why should I pay $90 an hour for you when uh, I can pay $50 an hour for this person? And um, the, 
the flight instructor said, well, at $90 an hour, I'm going to be able to get you through your private pilot certificate based on my track record uh, in this amount of time. Now, if the other instructor can guarantee that he'll get you through in this amount of time, you know, within reason, of course, I mean, with a, a reasonable spread there, of course, not a specific time, um, then you should go to the other instructor. But the fact is that uh, the flight instructor that charges more typically in the long run, and this may be hard to believe for those people who still have their finger in their ear, take it out now, because uh, that flight instructor that charges more may cost you less overall money in the long run. And I've seen that happen so many times if the flight instructor is indeed charging the value that he's worth. Just like a good car mechanic or a good airplane mechanic, they get right to the heart of the problem. You might pay double for the, the uh, mechanic, but he or she figures out right away what's wrong and fixes it. Whereas the cheap person takes three tries in five weeks to do it. It really That's is so true, true what you're saying. That's your <laughs> That's personal so suffering. Very good <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Or? Yeah, Ethan, let's go on to the next uh, viewer question. All right, the next question we have is from Tanner Henderson on Facebook. He says, oh, I'm sorry. No, that is the previous question. Let's that go on Ashley. to the current We've already had her, and Ashley, thanks for the previous question. That is a good last name there. It's such a good question, we decided to play it again. Yeah, yeah there you go. Over. Let's go with that. Oops, Our I question got my from. Uh, our question from Tanner Henderson uh, says, as a new flight instructor, how do I make sure I'm a great flight instructor? Okay. We have another so Tanner question. Tanner wants to know how to be a great, not just a good flight instructor. I think we kind of ran that one. Yeah, did we do that I think one? We, yeah. Okay. I think we ran that one. Well, I'll ground. tell you, and, and uh, I, on I the next book. on the next question, I'll get into that too a little bit for you to reinforce that. In the next question. Okay. okay. Well, let's go on then here to one of ours. Let's see. Now, this is, this is kind of a subject that comes up frequently among flight instructors and flight schools. A little wordy, but let me read it to you. It's well documented that our student completion rate is abysmal. AOPA study suggests that 80% of flight students don't finish. How do we keep our students flying through completion of their certificates? Greg? Okay. Or? Let's go ahead with the first slide. I'm just making sure. And Ethan, have your have your slide button finger ready there, okay? So why do people quit flying? Why do students quit? The uh, common answer is money, but money is not why. And I, I'm sort of the Ann Landers of aviation. I mean, I write this column and I've done it for all these years and people constantly contact me with concerns and questions and it's led me to understand they're very rarely money that causes them to quit. You have seen most of these reasons why they quit. The 80-20 rule has to do with 80% of most businesses comes from repeat business and only 20% comes from new business. So you wanna keep your customers as a CFI in a flight school. Why do, why do clients quit? Many different reasons here, unhappy with the CFI turnover, but it boils down to the last one. I can't finish this darn thing. I've ground to a halt. I'm not getting anywhere. This is expensive. I quit. Next slide, please. If you forget everything else I've said in terms of my contributions to this gathering today, this is the most important point I am personally going to make. Every single lesson, you need to have some kind of graphic that shows the syllabus, the, the training steps, and you need to show them, you need to show each student at the end of the lesson a debrief where they are in the process. So they understand that they're not treading water. They're making progress. They can see what they finished and they can see what remains. This is critical for keeping people flying. Next. Schedule the next lesson before the client leaves and have a callback policy for people who don't show up again. Don't just forget about them. If you haven't heard from somebody, have a policy. If you haven't heard from them for two weeks, you're gonna get back to them. Uh, a clear ground instruction policy, never end a lesson on a bad note. If there's a problem at the end of the lesson, they made a horrible landing and you had to take the airplane over to the mechanic to check the gear. We, some of us have seen this before. <laughs> 
you, you can't let it end on that. You either take them and do another maneuver that they're going to succeed at, or you give them an incentive, like tell you what, you had a rough lesson today. I'm not gonna charge you. I'm gonna charge you only for half my instructor time next lesson because I wanna get you back here and keep you on track. That's critical to keep every lesson they gotta leave happy. Next. Every one of us has run into people who are halfway through their lessons and they're discouraged. I think they're the only ones since the Wright brothers who couldn't master landings in the first lesson. We've run into these people and they are really frustrated. And any one of us watching this, if that person comes and talks to you about their problem, you can give them a five or 10 minute pep talk, make them feel better and they will come back. So this pep talk is so critical that you want to make sure your students, that you're welcoming them. If you need a pep talk, you'll let me know. If you're a business, you want to have a sign on somebody's door who says, see me if you need a pep talk. You can consider starting a Facebook group. I've got one uh, student pilot pep talk group on Facebook where people can get a pep talk. And then you need to publicly post the learning plateau and explain to every student what it is. And when they hit a learning plateau, drag them over there and talk to them again about what a learning plateau is. Next. So let's talk about syllabus for a second as a way of implementing this. We all know what an FAA syllabus is. We all use it. We should be using it. But there's no law that says we can't add stuff to the syllabus as a tool for us in addition to what is required. Next. Stage checks are really, really important. Now, 141 schools all have them. A lot of others do them. But even if you're an independent instructor, the stage check validates what you're teaching. It offers the student an opportunity to get another perspective. And one really critical thing it does is it allows them to fly with another critical observer before they get in with the examiner, as opposed to flying with Greg the whole time. And then the first time they meet David is, the first time anyone who's not Greg rides with him is, is David, and he's the examiner. We don't want that to happen. Next. Okay. <clears throat> another key point. Why the heck aren't the flight physical and the knowledge test on our syllabi? Uh, why, why don't we tell our students when they need to finish these things and make it official? The flight physical, we should have a plan with that to make sure that they can call AOPA medical and talk about it and do a turbo medical or whatever. We can't just send them to the examiner because there is a fair chance they'll fail, but we can help prevent that. And the knowledge test, this is really critical. The, the most common question I get is, what, what material should I use to study for the private pilot knowledge test? Who the heck is a student to make that determination? If your favorite materials are Rod's marvelous books, you should tell your students, unless you want to shop around, I, I recommend Rod Machado, or I recommend Gold Seal, or I recommend ASA. But you give them what they need to know so they can start on it, and you tell them, we're going to finish this right here on the syllabus so that they keep rolling and they don't get to the point where they're not taking their check ride because they're not they haven't taken the written next if you have a bigger business than just yourself if you've got a flight school you need to program in customer satisfaction checks where the chief flight instructor or the owner meets with the students periodically to find out how they're doing and if they're having any problems and then they can head off issues like CFI personality conflicts with this student. Next. And finally, you can even add uh, recognition, you know, achievement recognition uh, points in the syllabus where you're going to give people a, uh, an aviatrix sticker or put something on Facebook so that stuff doesn't get forgotten from a marketing standpoint. Greg, you are uh, you are now my new best friend again. Sorry, uh, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, the listen, the idea really of never let never, <laughs> sorry, never let anybody get out of an airplane without experiencing some form of success. Powerful, powerful stuff. Even if it's Bob, I've never seen anybody get out of an airplane uh, and unchoke themselves from that seat belt <laughs> before. That was incredible. Um, 
And I got to tell you, that learning plateau thing, uh, especially like on instrument training, I've never, ever seen it fail on instrument training that I, I can recall where there wasn't an incredibly long learning plateau. But there are three distinct plateaus with private pilot training. And um, those are, one of them is pre-solo, the other one is... Uh, is uh, post solo prior to solo across country, and then the last one is check ride prep or uh, pre check ride prep, and it's it, it's just it it is it is so amazing. Letting people know what to expect reduces their anxiety. So you really hit the nail on the head. And by the way, one last thing, I do have on my website a free syllabus or actually uh, two syllabi, if I pluraled that correctly. Um, the first syllabi is called a stick and rudder syllabus, and it's very comprehensive and it's a you know, basic syllabus I learned with uh, that I've modified over the years to help teach you the basic stick and rudder skills a person needs to fly, and also the basic ground instructor syllabus. For anybody that wants to be a, a good a, a ground instructor, this is a syllabus for a nine-week ground school, which, by the way, they were wow. teaching at Orange County Airport, uh, charging $350 per person because the market can bear that there. And at that time, it wasn't unusual to see 10 people in the class, except many of the CFIs didn't want to teach because they'd rather, rather be up flying. But, uh, you know... Uh, the career CFI, it's a perfect opportunity. And I got to tell you, having somebody you can ask questions of in a live ground school is pretty powerful stuff. The proof of that is all the weekend ground schools. Everybody studies on their own. But if you go looking for weekend ground schools, we've still got aviation seminars and mm -hmm. uh, American Flyers and many others. So somebody's going to those ground schools and they want to go to the classroom. And, and that's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And they can do both. You know, they can do Gold Seal Ground School. They can also do the Live Ground School. And you get you get the benefit of both. Believe me, you cannot get too much education, uh, practically speaking. Okay, Tamara, I hope that uh, answered your question, e even though it was a follow-on or a, a follow-up of a similar question earlier. We actually had a pretty good discussion on that. Uh, we've still got people queuing up. We're starting to run a little bit long here, so we're going to try to expedite this and get through a few of these questions and get on to the prize giveaway. So, uh, Ethan, what's our next question from a viewer? All right, our next question is from Wingmasters Aviation, and they ask, do you think calling a client a pilot versus a student makes sense from the start? Can I take that one? It's all I, I think it's critical. I, I don't think, I think, uh, you know, we can't help but call people students sometimes, but the, there's a lot of problems with calling someone a student. Uh, uh, none of us likes being a student uh, in the grand sense. Uh, we want to be we want to be there. We don't want to be on the way. And a student is kind of a letdown. The, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is call people clients or refer to them as pilots, you know. And now when you introduce someone, say, uh, here's Joe Smith. He just uh, completed his cross country. He's well along on his path. Um, but I, I'm guilty of using the word student, too, and referring to folks. But I think it is really should be relegated to discussions with other instructors. I think people should be called either clients or pilots, pilots in training uh, that suggests a degree of accomplishment and that they're almost there. Okay, thank you, Wingmasters. I hope that was a, a, fair, a fair enough answer for you. Uh, Dave, what do you think about we go ahead and get these, uh, this prize giveaway going? Does that sound like a good idea to you? I think we ought to, yeah. I'm, my butt's starting to get sore, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you okay. put, up that, put up that phone number and we'll have people start calling. We have a couple of prizes, but the, uh, the way we want to do this is incentivizing signups on the FAAsafety.gov. If you signed up on that website um, and your name is on the list, and this would be before the webinar started because I sent the list to our bookkeeper, um, we're going to take uh, the 10th caller, and the prize that uh, one of our generous sponsors volunteered to give us is a Bose A20 headset, which uh, any one of us three presenters will take home with us. <laughs> but uh, why don't you uh, dial this number? And if you're only if you're on the FAA list, and uh, we'll see how that comes out. I'll get a text, and we'll announce the winners. In the meantime, we certainly can handle a few more questions, Russ. Yeah, we will take some questions. So let me make one correction. The eighth caller wins the Bose the Bose headset. The ninth caller wins either Rod's private pilot or instrument digital collection. And this is a pretty valuable collection, so it's a re really nice prize. Caller number 10 has the most popular book that we all want, The Savvy Flight Instructor from Greg Brown. So 
8, 9, and 10 get prizes. They're all great, uh, so make those calls. Okay, while the calls are coming in and we'll, we'll find out how that worked out, let's take another uh, viewer question. Our next question is from Stephen Fix, and he asks, advice for CFIs who've renewed their licenses that they haven't taught in many years, say 20, hopefully will be my retirement job. Who, who right. have renewed their licenses? Uh, I, I can speak to that quickly. And I, as an examiner, I always get uh, retired airline pilots who let their CFI certificate lapse and now they want to get recurrent, so they have to fly a CFI, you know, recurrency check ride, probably in a Cessna, which they haven't seen in 40 years. Um, so I guess the first step is don't let the CFI lapse. Um, and it's a wonderful retirement. I mean, I, I take senior aviators all the time, and I try to get them back into the industry because they have a wealth of experience. They're calm in the air. They have good personal skills. They make absolutely the best flight instructors. So... Uh, the key thing, though, is to keep that CFI current. If it's expired, you have to get comfortable in little planes again and fly with an examiner. And it's not a very extensive, but it is, uh, you know, a flight that involves several takeoffs, landings, and really a review of current regulations and the um, uh, ability to control that plane to the standards and teach at the same time. In other words, just like the initial CFI, it's a teaching. We want to see that that skill is still there. Does that cover okay, the Okay, thank you, Stephen. I, I've seen you on the internets on Facebook, I believe, so thanks for, uh, thanks for joining in with that question. Ethan, how about another? I can hear that phone ringing in the background. <laughs> All right, the next question we have is from Aileron Banks. It says, are there CFIs with disabilities or physical challenges, or can an initial CFIA candidate with a disability become an instructor? And I can speak to, to that one immediately. There's a young lady named Sherry Coyne Marshall that uh, probably some of you know. And uh, Sherry is uh, missing an arm. And, uh, uh, and she's a flight instructor. Not only that, but she was uh, an airline pilot. I th I'm not sure if she's still doing that now. But uh, so disabilities um, are, uh, well, there comes a point where maybe that becomes an issue, but depending on the disability. But uh, if uh, you're talking about a loss of an appendage, then uh, that certainly doesn't seem to be uh, an issue for, uh, for Sherry. And she was able to easily obtain a CFI certificate. They just work around the disability as best they can. And as long as you can convince the FA that you'll be safe doing that, uh, then that's a heck of a deal. And what a great way to, uh, to continue uh, <clears throat> your aviation career. Okay, thank you for that one. How the, are, we st are we starting to get any feedback yet, David? I just wrote her a text. I haven't heard back. She's probably okay. busy scurrying around looking Man, through the FAA list. I would just say to you. both those people yeah. that ask questions, though, about the um, flight, flight instructor, I think people you know, that have been aviators their whole life that maybe have a commercial or a retired airline, please get back into the business. The industry needs you so badly. Uh, it really does. You have all those mm. life experiences. You can relate to people. You've probably taught many times many things and it's a very easy transition to get into teaching aviation um, and you'll love it it really is a wonderful connection with people we really need yeah, and you that's, in the industry that's very true david yeah, one of the things i found about transitioning uh, airline pilots who haven't flown general aviation airplanes in uh, four decades is that i explained to them that uh, it's a little different than flying a boeing 747 and mm -hmm. uh, don't ask me to raise their gear when we take off either, because you can't raise the gear in a Cessna 150, uh, but they'll try it anyway. And they should expect to uh, spend a few hours mastering the controls of a small airplane. And just because they've flown big ones doesn't mean that they can just jump right in and fly small ones, because that is just not true. Oh, it takes time. Those principles, no. everything about flying a small airplane pertains to uh, flying a big one, but not everything about flying a big airplane pertains to flying a small one. Yeah, very okay. correct. It's it's not easy for a lot of these guys uh, to come back, but it's a very worthwhile pursuit. As long as you go into it humble and you don't say, hey, I drive the big iron, a 150. 150 is probably the hardest plane to fly, as we all know. No, no, no. One, 150 heavy. Oh, yeah, 150. Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay. See, only Let's the three um... of us could probably fit in that plane, right? <laughs> yeah. I flew yeah, with a guy once short with legs. Well, I, I flew with a guy once that was 370 in the Cessna 150, which is really big when you consider that 360 was a full circle. So uh, this guy was amazing. <laughs> that's neither here nor there. 
Okay, we've got our accounting firm still busily back there going through the, uh, through the prize entries. So let's take another viewer question. Um, Jenny says, uh, right now we could stop calling. We do have the 8th, 9th, and 10th, and they're just uh -huh. putting the results together now. So okay. the phone is well, like ringing off the hook. All right, the, the lucky people have, have been selected. The lucky let's... people are being adjudicated at this point. <laughs> so we will uh, anxiously Four anticipate that announcement soon. Let's hit up with another viewer question. All right, this question I'm afraid is too long to actually put on the screen, but it's from Jason Cordero on Facebook. And Jason writes, I'm about halfway done with my CFI training and plan to take my check ride in early August. What tips can the experts give me for the check ride? And what should I work on the most to not be a part of the percentage uh, of the FDSO that have the 90% failure rate? A broad question, and I suspect uh, my guess is Dave will probably be the first one to take a swing at this one. Well, I, I think we, you know, what Rod said, I, I, I think is just key, which is <clears throat> it's not a test about flying, it's a test about teaching. Uh, you've already proved your commercial ability, uh, now you have to prove to some pilot examiner or an, an FAA uh, inspector that you can teach. And really the skills, get up in front and teach, uh, you know, your friends or your neighbors anything, just so you get good verbal skills and then start to integrate the aviation knowledge into it and, and get fluid. What Greg said just previously was, yes, you have to teach every one of those lessons so that you're good at it. And uh, if you prepare correctly, you will not be part of the statistics. Um, you should have a good instructor to do this training, as we also mentioned. And <clears throat> when they say you're ready, you will do fine. I've, I can't think of how many CFIs I've put through. I've never had a failure. Um, because, you know, it's a matter of making sure good day, bad day, they're going to be able and capable of, uh, of delivering. And that's what the FAA is looking for, is they're looking for safety, somebody who can both control the plane safely, and with that split brain experiment, also teach with the other half of their brain. So they're very carefully looking at your skills. Okay, uh, well, let we me continue just say, to... Let me, let me, yeah, go ahead, please, let just, please. Let me just say this. Dave, you are so back in. Uh, you're number one. Sorry, Greg, you're number two now. That, that, uh, that, I was just checking idea. the results. Do I win the boast? <laughs> yeah. uh, honorary mention. But what uh, again, that, that whole idea, I don't know if there's anything more important than just make sure you go in as a teacher. And, and take control. What you said is huge. You know, you instructional, uh, grab it. That's right. You're the teacher. And uh, <clears throat> don't stop teaching until he tells you. Or hands you a white pilot flight instructor certificate not a pink one a white one <laughs> a white one i've got a pink one can i teach with this <laughs> yeah while we're waiting <laughs> on this on our final results coming in while we're waiting on the final results coming in on our prizes let me mention that uh this is going to be a hard act to follow but we do have a pretty exciting program set up for you in august so stay keep in keep in touch with us at goldsealgroundschool.com slash live, because I think you'll want to hear about the program we, we have planned for next month. It'll not it's not just for flight instructors, it's for all pilots. So are we getting Should anything, we? Uh, are we getting anything yeah, from Yeah, I've got Jenny all yet? three names here. <clears throat> okay, well, let's Excuse go me, for them. I've got all three names. Okay, uh, which one did we want to announce first was the Bose? I guess the, the big uh, one. Prize number eight goes to Joshua Williamson. Joshua Williamson, uh, if after this program, yes, I mean a Bose headset. Thank you, John Snip and, and the Bose Corporation. That is a biggie. Um, but if after this show you call that same number and uh, talk with Jenny, she'll get your information and ship that headset out to you. Uh, prize number nine goes to Deborah Minnick, and that was, I think, the uh, Rod Machado, um, either a private or an instrument. And I do know, actually, Deborah Minnick. She probably would want the instrument because she just finished her private, so perfect for her. Hey, cool. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, very nice. And uh, number 10 is Vance Breeze, B-R-E-E-S-E, -E -E, Vance Breeze. So all three of you, if you call that phone number and uh, convey your information, um, they will arrange for your prizes to be shipped. And thank you both, yeah, Greg and, and Rod, for those uh, gifts. Oh, our pleasure. The Thank you Vance, for when you call, when Vance calls in, let me know if you want a digital one or a paper one, a digital book okay. or a paper book, please. Okay. Are you able to, can you autograph a digital one? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you can sell it on eBay. On, on the disc. <laughs> Okay, well, that wraps uh -huh. us up for tonight. Guys, thanks so much for, for, for joining us here. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, I've really enjoyed hanging out with you guys for the evening. Uh, Rod, I see a finger coming I, up. I, Go ahead. I, Jake, I, I apologize. If anybody, um, for anybody that was on this list to sign up, they go to my website and uh, use the discount code ROD, R-O-D, capital R-O-D. You apply that in the window at, at checkout. Uh, it's for a 25% discount for 48 hours. How cool so, is okay. that? Wow. wow. Everybody Thank wins. You, Rod. Everybody Again, wins. ROD bank coupon window. 48 hours. Good deal. Well, CFIs, thanks clock for joining us now. tonight. I'm sorry? I said Dave? the clock starts now, 48 hours. Russ, thank you so much for hosting us tonight. Thank what you. A wonderful yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave uh, and Russ and uh, uh, Greg. What a wonderful panel and what a, a great group of professional folks to have. It's an honor being able to be associated with you, and uh, I, I I feel quite honored. Okay, thank you, oh, Russ. everybody. I feel that way. Thanks for okay, thanks for being one. with us tonight, and visit us online at onlinegroundschool.com. Good flying. This webinar was brought to you by SAFE, the Society of Aviation and Flight Educators and by the Gold Seal Online Ground School, where instructors join for free and monitor their students' progress. Learn more at onlinegroundschool.com.